Hey everybody, in this video I'll be um, showing you how to calculate um, traditional effect sizes using SSD for R. And to do this I'm going to use the Jenny data set that comes with uh, our textbook. Um, so I'm going to use the get CSV function and notice that I'm just using the class script um, and I'm just going to change the names of the variables. I'll add to it um, during the course of this video, but my suggestion is, is that you just work with one script and you just um, don't copy and paste into new scripts. Uh, it gets confusing. Okay, so I'm going to run the get CSV that I already have and I'm going to use the Jenny AB that has um, intervention data and I'm just going to keep hitting run. I'm going to get the uh, attached done and I'm just going to show you the data set and um, this looks like the baseline data that you had previously but it also has intervention data for yelling, crying, calling out and self-esteem and again you see that um, each variable can have different lengths of baseline. For instance, um, the baseline for yelling is longer than for crying uh, and for, and calling out has the shortest uh, and esteem actually has the longest. Um, it doesn't really matter. But um, before we get started with um, effect sizes though, I wanna direct your attention to the PowerPoint for this lesson. Um, and these are the four on the left, the four types of effect sizes that you can calculate in SSD for R and the different conditions under which they can be used. And um, I'll show you um, what I mean by similar variations. But notice that if you have trending in any phase, uh, the only uh, a traditional effect size you can use is the G index. And it, that's not really quite a traditional effect size, um, but it falls more under that category than the non-overlapping methods that we're going to address next week. Notice that if you have autocorrelation in any phase, um, none of these traditional effect sizes will be appropriate. And the ones we cover in the next uh, lesson will be. And if you are comparing more than two phases that are um, phases that two phases that aren't adjacent to each other, um, that would only be appropriate with the G index. So the G index has more flexibility. Um, however, the D index and hedges G um, can be used when um, uh, you have dissimilar variations but no trending or autocorrelation in any phase. And for the purposes of this class, we're not going to have more than two phases. I strongly suggest um, that my students um, keep a copy of this slide because it will help them make informed decisions later on. Okay, so we're, with that in mind, we're gonna flip, oops, we're gonna flip over to our Studio Cloud. And um, the first, let's take a look at Jenny's yelling behavior as an example um, to start out with. We don't really need this. We can flip over to our script. Um, and to look at variation between phases, um, and let's start with an AB plot to just visualize that. We're gonna change AB plot to, uh, we we're having other stuff going on here. And um, this is school day. I'll just go day. And, um, Jenny's yelling. We'll hit run. Whoops. Whoops, did I? Oh, I put, see? Everybody makes mistakes, even the person that wrote the book. That's okay that you saw a mistake. It's actually good. Um, what I, the reason I realized this was the mistake is it says this object yelling is not found. So that means I either didn't attach my file properly or I spelled this uh, variable incorrectly in some way. 
Okay, here we go. Now, when we think about variation between phases, what we think about is, well, how much uh, movement is there within each phase compared to the others? Um, and again, this is one of the assumptions that we need to take into account. Um, it looks like uh, the yelling in Jetty's baseline, there's a lot more movement from the lowest to the highest, and it goes up and down and up and down. There is some up and down in the intervention phase, but not as much. Um, and this, if you think this sounds like it's related to the standard deviation, you are correct. Um, so let's take a look at the standard deviation. Actually, the variance is the square of the standard deviation. Fun fact. Let's take a look at that standard deviation. And here it is. Um, so we see that the variance is not too, the, the, the standard deviations are really not too similar. In fact, there's the, ver the standard deviation is uh, twice as great in the baseline that it is in the standard deviation. Um, and when we think about um, this, we really want to think about the ratio of the variance of the larger uh, standard deviation to the smaller. So we could actually do, uh, we can make use uh, R as a calculator and look at that ratio. Like if we said, whoops, Put it down here. 1.265. If you want a um, an exponent in R Studio Cloud, you use the little caret and divide it by 0.556 squared. Um, that that variance is is very high. Um, you want it really pretty close to one. It can go up to about two or so to consider similarity. But in this case, we know that the variance is not similar between these phases. By the way, if the standard deviations are very close, um, you'll be able to, you wouldn't have to really do this calculation. Um, so what this does is this throws out the ES and the G indexes possible possibilities uh, for us in using a traditional effect size with Jenny's yelling, that leaves us with the D index or hedges G. Um, so what we really need to do now is look and see if there's a trend in either phase, a significant trend. Um, so let's find that code in now, we, to look for a trend in one phase, we can use the A regress function. To look for a trend in both phases simultaneously, we can go A B regress and yell and P yell and uh, A and B. Make sure you put those in quotation marks. And then when you run that code, um, you'll be able to see that. And uh, this is the A phase, this is the B phase, and that's the regression line you've seen previously. And um, let me see if I can pull this over if it looks better. Mm, not really. Okay. Um, this up here is the A phase, where it says here's the function, and this is the output for the A phase. And this is the significance level. Um, if we rerun it, It'll probably go all on one line. Let me do that for you. Yeah, that looks more like what you probably see in class. Okay, and we know in the baseline there is no significant trend because this value is over 0 0.05. The interpretation is the same as we've talked about it in class. Um, and there is no significant trend in the intervention. Remember, we're not looking at the intercept line. We're looking at either X1 or X2. So for yelling, we're, we're pretty safe 
um, with, uh, we have uh, dissimilar variation between the phases, but there's no significant trend. We are only dealing with two phases, so now we have to look at autocorrelation. And there is only one, we can't do an AB, uh, it, we can't get them both at the same time, so we'll just do one at a time. Yep, PL. And you've done this possibly before in class. Um, but here we see that our uh, magnitude of our autocorrelation is low, and it's non significant, so it's not a problem in the baseline. We don't have to address it there. Um, Let's just change this A to a B, and we'll run it again. And here we again see it's fairly low and non-significant, so we can use either the D index or hedges G as an appropriate effect size. So now we're really ready to add majorly to our script. And I'm going to make a note, we're going to compare baseline, well, we're really comparing the intervention to baseline, and we're going to do traditional effect sizes, and the command is easy. It's effect size, and uh, we're going to put in the parameters. First we have our behavior variable, so yell, and then PL. And then the two faces we want to compare in quotation marks. And that's what you see in the um, call out right there. And now we're going to get a whole slew of stuff. Notice you don't get any more graphs, by the way. And this is not a graph generating situation here. Um, but this is the key at the very top. This key stays the same. Um, in all circumstances, but a small effect size is um, 0.87, a medium effect size is between 0.87 and 2.67, and anything greater than uh, that is considered a large effect. Okay, so we can't look at the ES, we can look at the D index or hedges G, and you'll notice that these are uh, very similar. Um, the results are very similar. So D, the D index, now you have to think of the direction of change. This could be something bad, but in the case of Jenny's yelling, it is not. Um, the calculated value for the D index is 1.94711. We would round it to 1.95. And we see from the key up here that that's considered a medium effect. Um, what this really says is between baseline and intervention, there is a 47.42% change in Jenny's yelling behavior. And that's really a great measure for quantifying um, change because that's something uh, we can all pretty much wrap our heads around that, you know, the behavior improved by almost a half. When we look at Hedges G, um, it's a little bit more conservative of a calculation, but you'll see it's similar. Instead of 1.95, it's 1.90. And uh, that calculation is a 47.11% uh, degree of change. And um, again, that's a medium effect. Now, here you have the chance to either save this, append an existing file, or neither. Uh, for the purposes of this class, we're just going to hit neither. You can actually save these because you could aggregate uh, effect sizes into a meta-analysis, which is for a later day. Um, so we're just going to hit neither. Um, but just so you're aware that um, people typically um, notice a qualitative change with not a small effect that may be very small or you know not discernible, but medium and large effects. So um, Jenny's sort of lived experience with yelling has probably improved enough um, with this intervention that it is noticeable uh, in class. Um, and the next one I want to show you is just uh, one specific one, and that's um, Jenny's calling out behavior. And actually, you know what, maybe we will do, uh, yeah, we'll do calling out. Um, I'm, I'm telling you right here 
that um, the data are autocorrelated, but I just want to demonstrate the G index for you. But understand that there is a trend in the data. So we're going to pretend that the variation is similar between phases. There is a trend, but there's no autocorrelation. And we'll do that with her calling out behavior. Uh, and that function is G index. And it's set up similarly to uh, most of the comparison um, functions. So it's going to be call out and p call out and, and the two phases that we want to compare, which is just A and B. And if we hit run, now because there is a um, trend in the data, we're going to want to use the regression output. And what this does is you get an adjusted mean line, a median line, and a regression line. And um, what we're trying to do is look at um, data that falls in a desired zone. And so you have to think about if you want the behavior to increase. If you want it to increase, you would want to look at where the output where it says above the lines. Uh, but since we want the behavior to decrease, we'd want it to look below the lines. Again, we have a key, an effect size of 0.3, less than 0.3 is considered a small effect. From 0.3 um, to 0.5 would be considered a medium effect, and anything greater than 0.5 would be considered a large effect. Um, so we want the regression output, and we're going to go to below the lines. And um, the amount that we want to look at, the, the calculated value is 0.375, which is considered a medium effect. So um, if this was the correct um, type of effect size to use, it's not, but um, we'll use it for now. It's really since we, since the the data really are autocorrelated, we'll need to we would need to use a uh, non-traditional effect size that we'll cover in the next lesson. But again, for demonstra uh, demonstration purposes, uh, we're going to use that calculated value of uh, 0.375. That's an improvement in her behavior, um, and again, this would be considered a medium effect. And uh, that's all I have for you for this video. Hope this is helpful.